Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, machaba, ciao, bonjour, namaste, jumbo, bienvenidos, hey, my name is Jed Lee, welcome to Reading with your kids. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so very honored and so delighted that you join us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. We do that by sharing fun, thoughtful, and thought-provoking conversations with fascinating people who just happen to be writing books for kids of all ages. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show and let them know that they can hear us on the WREB AMFM 24-7 radio network. And they can find us on the iHeartRadio app, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, Amazon Music, Audible, Podcast Attic, wherever you find your favorite shows. We do indeed have three fascinating guests here helping us celebrate episode 2000 of reading with your kids. We thought about doing, you know, the traditional pat yourself on the back congratulatory things, but instead on this day we want to celebrate the power of storytelling. Dr. Amra Shabitz El Reyes will be here talking to us about the power of diverse storytelling. We'll have a listen back to our conversation with Father Greg Boyle, founder of Homeboy Industry, the largest gang intervention program in the world, and then we'll be going back to the Connecticut Book Festival to speak with Peanut Bird. Are you looking for a creative way to bond with your kids? Let me tell you all about Drawing With Your Kids, the ultimate destination for artistic adventures. Join us as we dive into the wonderful world of children's books with renowned illustrators guiding you step by step. From beloved characters to whimsical scenes, unleash your imagination and create cherished memories together. Whether you're a seasoned artist or just picking up a pencil, there's something for everyone at Drawing With Your Kids. Please visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com, and click on the Drawing With Your Kids link at the top of the page and let the creativity flow. Drawing With Your Kids, where every stroke brings stories to life. Join us right now from New York City. Our guest is here today to celebrate her brand new middle grade novel. It's called Three Summers. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Amra Shabic El Reyes. Hey, Dr. Amra, how are you? I'm very well. How are you? I am fantastic. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, Dr. Amra is an expert when it comes to telling diverse storytelling or, or more specifically talking about the power of diverse storytelling. And so I'm really looking forward to having a discussion with you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here and honored to be speaking with you about the power of storytelling and in particular diverse storytelling. So thank you for having me. You're welcome. Um, first, can you tell us a little bit about your background? You are a professor at Columbia, correct? Yes, I'm a professor at Columbia University at the Graduate School of Education, Health and Psychology. Um, I am also a faculty member affiliated with Middle East Institute and with Harriman Institute for Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union. And I also run the first ever the International Interfaith Research Lab at a graduate school of education in the United States, uh, which is centered on uh, building research and scholarship and uh, training programs that are evidence-based on prevention of hate and hate-fueled violence. That is a, a pretty big mission for you and certainly one that is that is desperately needed, I think. Yes, I, um, I am also a Bosnian uh, genocide survivor. Um, I grew up living for nearly 1,200 days under a military siege um, as a Bosnian Muslim being targeted for my identity in 1990s. That is what defined uh, my growing up uh, in, uh, in Bosnia. I lived cut off from the rest of the world starved, bombed every day, not having access to normal schooling, even though I was a complete math and physics nerd, 
Um, and in fact, I talk about that experience in my first memoir, The Cat I Never Named, which was published uh, uh, four years ago. And now Three Summers, my new book, uh, really travels upstream in my life. Um, I decided to go back to the time when I was actually a child, unchanged by the exp experience of uh, targeted violence. Um, and those are the three most beautiful, magical summers of my life, which I thought were worthy of sharing because they're also a warning of how life can change when we allow for hate to define our societies. You know, we've, I, I recently spoke to a, a woman who grew up during the Armenian genocide. And she also had this wonderful positive outlook when you said that the three summers uh, when you were experiencing this hate and violence and uh, probably possible death every day, that they were three magical summers. Um, I'm... I'm having a hard time kind of wrapping my head around that. How – and it, it's a beautiful thing that you're able to find joy and and happiness and love despite experiencing all this horror. Well, for three summers, they, they actually depict three summers on the eve of war and genocide. So three – last three summers before – actual um uh genocide begins and i and i start to live under the conditions of a military siege and so on that experience in in is depicted in the cat i never named my first book but three summers is also um a warning because genocide never happens overnight it is, it begins with the narrative of hate. It begins with, and genocide is the most extreme form of targeted violence, targeting a group for, to, to, for their eradication in part or whole. But even thinking about what often happens in the United States where we have mass shootings and targeted violence where a kid might be playing in a sandbox in fifth grade and by the time they reach the age of 17 or 18, somehow they think that the way to address whatever grievances they have is to target people in a supermarket in Buffalo, New York. Um, and, you know, for me, going back to three summers, these last three summers before the, the start of the genocide was important because while I am growing up and experiencing summer crushes in my hometown of Bihach, which I think is one of the most beautiful um, uh, small towns in, in in the world. It has a, a gorgeous emerald green river that runs through it uh, that was named by Romans, Una, meaning one and only because of its unique beauty. Um, so I am growing up with my favorite cousins who are diverse by backgrounds uh, along with my uh, extended family. And when we say family in Bosnia, it's not it's not five or 10 members. We're talking about 50 people getting together at the picnic table by, by the river on a small river island that used to be owned my, by um, my great-grandfather. Um, but what happens parallel to the sort of idyllic uh, uh, childhood that I had and very strong sense of family and connection is also escalation of narrative of hate. People cannot actually commit an act of harm against another human being without normalizing the idea that that human being somehow is subhuman or not human at all. And so at the age of 11, 12, or 13, I experience what I don't wish for any um, child to experience is this escalation of narrative that somehow I am different. I am different in a way that I uh, should not be a part of society. And what was particularly challenging at that time is that my favorite cousin in Three Summers in the story is a, um, a girl whose mom is my aunt and whose father is a Serb military officer in the army that ultimately partakes um, in the atrocities against Bosnian Muslims. And so I get to experience this escalation of hate 
at a picnic table, quite literally, with my family. And so I transformed from being a young uh, kid who doesn't really understand um, what is going on and is simply growing up and dealing with being uh, six feet tall at the age of 11 and, and, and turning, you know, transforming from being a young girl to a young woman, um, while at the same time um, receiving these narratives that by third summer portrayed me as someone who does not belong and who should be eradicated. I, I can't imagine living living through something like that how were you, were you able to cope you know resilience is a powerful emotion but it is not something that's derived just from us individually it's derived from our community i always think of our collective resilience and i think of resilience not only as a response to violence or trauma. When something painful happens to us, we always think about resilience or people will um, uh, quite often remark and say, Amr, you're so resilient. How could you even talk about these experiences? It took a long time and it's painful and it's hard and it actually comes at a great cost. There are moments when in interviews like this, I do break down and I cry, um, uh, even though it's been many, many decades. So it doesn't get necessarily easier. One simply learns how to manage um, their own lived experience. I can't separate it from who I am. It had defined me. But I also want to highlight that that when we when we are stronger in and when we're strong in getting through difficult times, it is often uh, because our community has helped uplift us. And for me, it was my cousins, the girls that I talk about in three summers, um, thinking about their love and care uh, for for one another and how close we we became over those three summers gave me a source of hope that I am a human being when human beings didn't think I was, when I was being bombed every day, when um, my house was hit on my birthday and my mom became deaf and my father was injured and, and so on. In those moments, I returned to these three summers, to the memories of the, these three summers and thought about my cousin who was half Muslim and half Serb and who loved me so deeply and profoundly and who was so kind to me. And I thought, well, I think that there are human beings out there who think of me as a human being and I will hold on to that. And that was my source of resilience. You know, this certainly is a book that I would strongly encourage families to read together. Maybe not curled up on the couch like we do with our five-year-olds, but with our middle-grade kids, I think this would be a really powerful book to co-read and to talk about on our way to school, over the dinner table. Other than just the narrative, what kind of conversations – do you hope families will have if they're talking about three summers? You know, one of the uh, one of the um, expectations that that uh, people have often is when when you talk about uh, how a story might make us uh, hopefully better human beings, and that is what I hope my stories do. That that is the effect ultimately that I hope to have on on readers, whether whether adults or children. Um, there is this, and when when one tells stories of, of um, experiencing challenges, one often expects that it will be a difficult read. Um, and what I, what I think uh, many members of, of my, my audience um, are surprised, even with the cat I never named, which tells my story of surviving genocide uh, for for near nearly four years, three and a half years, there is so much love, and there is so much um, happiness in these stories. And I think it is because sometimes when we think of a person who is a genocide survivor, we think that this uh, difficult experience defines them fully and completely. Uh, but when we get to know a human being, then we realize 
this is a human being who is struggling with, you know, putting on a bathing suit for the first time and, 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 and being self-aware as a young girl of how she looks or how others might, uh, might judge her for her height or for, for her body image. Um, they also will, will, uh, uh, realize that the, humanity that we have is a shared humanity, that I am as much of a young girl, preteen, teen, as anyone else uh, might be today in New York or Mississippi or Florida. And it is that humanity of, you know, first summer crushes, uh, swimming in the river, laughing, getting in trouble um, that can connect us and humanize us. And I think that is ultimately the lesson of three summers my story um of three of the three most magical summers is really invitation to an adult or a child um to be in solidarity uh with other human beings and to recognize that we're so much more alike um than we're different yeah. why did you choose this middle grade audience to share your story story with for me, it's really important to tell my story authentically. Um, and so even when I was writing The Cat I Never Named, it is a story that, that transpires when I am uh, uh, an older teen. And so that story is written for young adults, and really it's a crossover, young adult and adult um, uh, memoir. And similarly, with three summers, when I was thinking of what is the next story that I wish to share with the world, I thought it was a powerful example of sisterhood that withstands these narratives of hate coming at us as children uh, from the adult world. It's an inspirational story of, uh, of connection. Um, uh, some of uh, uh, one of my cousins in uh, um, in in our sisterhood struggled, for instance, with learning disabilities. Um, and so those stories are true story. They're authentic, and I wanted to tell them the way that they had happened because I do think that the power is in telling these stories as, as nonfiction. Um, so, for instance, you know, an 11 year old child in the United States, uh, depending on on their lived experience um, might might be able to to uh, to relate even to some of the most difficult experiences I've had. There is rise of hate and hate fueled narratives and othering and the humanization in the United States. So even though I'm in a different geography and context, um, they will be able to recognize the patterns that are very similar to what many kids are experiencing in the U.S. And so for me, telling those stories authentically was important. And I was a middle grader at that time. And so I, I tell them in that voice. Yeah. The power of diverse storytelling, as, as we're speaking, I, I'm thinking that the thing that was fueling the hate that came at you was very, um, I don't know what the word is, undiverse storytelling just you know just repeating the the mantra that this group of people are subhuman and don't deserve to live so i um i'll share with you and i'll share that proudly that i was a total nerd i was a math and physics geek i played volleyball i was a straight a student i uh, went to, uh, I attended and graduated from one of the most competitive math high schools in my country. I was one of, ranked one of the top 10 kids in math and physics um, in the country and, and placed on a list of 10 kids to be saved um, during genocide by Bosnia's wartime government at the time. Um, so, so for me, um, the that experience of being as perfect as I could possibly be was driven by this desire to humanize myself in my society. Because as as early as being of eight, being of age seven and, and eight, I recall that I used to search in my word problems, math word problems, um, for 
kid's name like Amra or Muhammad, a, a kid who was a Muslim kid who I felt would be, I felt I would be seen and recognized as a human being if I could see my identity normalized in, in the stories that I've read. But the only stories that I've read were the stories that ridiculed or historically targeted my community as not belonging to Europe, as not belonging to this imagined um, um, imagined contest, uh, context. And so in many ways, I was deeply aware that I was what I now in my scholarship at Columbia refer to as as educationally displaced. You could be the top student in a school anywhere in the United States, but you might still feel displaced because your identity is not, uh, you don't feel it, it is being recognized or celebrated in the way that someone else's identity is. And I want to highlight something, Jed, that I think is very important. And a lot of my research shows this, that in, in many political narratives in our country, diverse storytelling has been perceived that if I, if I tell Amra stories, I won't tell Jed's story. So we're kind of competing for real estate in storytelling. What we fail to understand is that when Amra hears Jed's story and Jed hears Amra's story, that we enrich one another and that we protect one another from hate. So diverse storytelling for me it, it is not only about representation. It is about protecting our societies from violence that, that we may experience on a smaller or larger scale. So because I was displaced from the curricula and storytelling as a, as a Muslim child in my, in my society growing up, that's why genocide eventually was normalized and was okay, because I actually was never integrated as a human being through the educational system, through the diverse storytelling. So if you don't read, learn about someone as a human being, then what is there to stop us from inflicting violence against that targeted group? Mm -hmm. So that's why diverse storytelling matters. It is protective factor against hate for all of us. It certainly is. One of the things that we've celebrated uh, repeatedly here on the podcast, of course, is the idea that books can act as mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors for our kids. And being an old white guy, the, seeing myself positive, positively portrayed on the pages of books, that, that was happening all the time. But for me, that books can be a window into another culture, into another faith, into another way of life is super important and uh, to me is uh, the real superpower of books because it can help us see people that, that speak differently, look differently, eat different foods, are actually still members of our beautiful human family. Absolutely, and I deliberately uh, for those who will read Three Summers and also The Cat I Never Named, I deliberately bring in Bosnian words. Um, and in fact, many, many uh, roots to the language in Bosnia is reflective of uh, Bosnia being occupied, dominated by different forces and powers over the course of uh, hundreds of years of its uh, history. So we were uh, uh, um, we were occupied and colonized by the Romans and Hungarians and Austrians and the Ottomans um, and under uh, Nazi uh, Germany's puppet state in, in Croatia during World War II. So through all of these experiences, um, the, the, the country itself, the language itself, the culture itself has been uh, in a way, the the mosaic of all of those influences throughout the history. And so I bring up um, different foods. I bring up um, different uh, different Bosnian words um, and, and, and showcase the meaning through the story because seeing them on the pages of the paper, for me, is a celebration of that history, celebration of of where I come from and the fact that it took generations of survivors through all of these wars and conflicts historically 
for me actually to be here it's it's um uh, it's quite remarkable when i think about my own lineage and family history and persecution throughout the history yeah. how can we because we're living in a time right now we've we've talked about here in the podcast where it seems people have lost the ability to have conversations with others who may not think like they do, which may not have the same perspective. And I'm seeing uh, big divisions grow within our society. How can we reverse this and bring back not only the civility that I thought existed years ago, but, but even make our country, our society truly inclusive and um, truly feel like a, 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 a nation, a family? Thank you for that question. A lot of work that I do, um, I had mentioned that I um, I lead um, uh, the International Interfaith Research Lab uh, that I had established at Columbia. And I've also um, uh, won a number of federal innovation grants for research on hate prevention that um, have um, allowed me to create programs, and I'll, um, I'll name them for you in case they're educators or other stakeholders who are interested in them. Mm-hmm. One of them is Reimagine Resilience, and, and people can go just to reimagineresilience.org. And another one is Project uh, Belonging.org. Uh, Project Belonging um, is a program where we actually work with schools, with middle schoolers and high schoolers, where we raise awareness of how hate emerges based on all of the scholarship and research that I've done. We use storytelling and we support students um, to build a sense of belonging in their community where students take the lead in envisioning what that might look like, what might be helpful to their community to come together as a family. And Reimagine Resilience is a program where we train educators, we've trained law enforcement, we've spoken to folks. Uh, uh, policymakers uh, and many other community stakeholders, faith leaders, about how do we reimagine um, uh, the way that we really work with one another and engage with one another so that we can have genuine dialogue and conversations. Because when we don't, when we don't talk about difficult topics effectively, constructively, and when we don't feel safe to do that, then we will seek other alternative places of belonging outside of the mainstream society. And that actually doesn't help any of us. It doesn't matter where somebody is on, let's say, their ideological or political spectrum, what they think about our healthcare policy or foreign policy or whatnot. When there is, um, when there are grievances that are unaddressed within our society and when they escalate to being systemic, uh, we are at the risk of um, the kind of uh, fa- failing uh, that I had survived. I had lost, um, in a way, two homelands already. So I know what that journey feels like, what it looks like, and ultimately where hate can take us. And if there's, I mean, the reason why I wrote these stories is because I am concerned where America is headed I am concerned that we're not sharing um, uh, spaces effectively anymore in the way that we have. And I think storytelling um, um, storytelling is one way into people's hearts. It's hard for us to convince each other if we uh, have opposing views on any subject matter through just statistics. And it comes from someone who is, as I said, a math nerd and I taught statistics, created design courses for statistics, and still do teach them at Columbia. But it is it is the power of storytelling. It is the power of you and me meeting Jed and understanding that we're both human beings that will allow us to, to talk with one another in a way that is civil, that is respectful, respectful and that builds empathy. Yeah. Well, I... I absolutely agree with you. It is it is needed. Um, uh, I, I I just I just pray that we're able to come together, and um, because uh, the United States is a pretty special place, and uh, I think there's a lot of potential here, 
and uh, we need to we need to work together to meet that potential. Are there ways for families other than sitting down and reading three summers together and having some great conversations? Uh, are there ways for people who are listening to get involved in any of those groups that you mentioned? Yes. Um, so um, because we have uh, we have won different research innovation grants, and when I say we, <clears throat> I'm not just referring to myself, but also to my graduate research assistants and 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 um, staff that works with me, who are experts in education, who work with me in creating various programs. So people can go to um, uh, Interfaith Labs website if they just search my name and Interfaith Lab, which should take them to the website for the lab. We have, for instance, a faith leader training that we will be launching in August um, in the United States to bring in faith leaders across different faith groups into the conversation on how we can build resilience to hate in our communities. Um, we, I also take a whole of society approach to thinking about how, how do we become a more socially cohesive, unified um, uh, society. So that means working with all stakeholders across um, uh, different uh, areas. Um, so educators can take Reimagine Resilience training that we have online. We have uh, asynchronous training, but also I visit schools almost every every week, several times, uh, depending on my travel schedule. Uh, but basically, we will go and train entire schools. We, there are schools across the United States um, that we have been working with for several years where we will offer professional training programs. And one of the best um, aspects of what we do is that often because we have research grants that support our work, we can offer those trainings uh, to many entities for free. Um, so for those who might be listening and thinking, how much does this cost? Can I afford this? And, and so on. Uh, many of our resources are available um, for free because we're able to obtain external funding, either federal uh, from federal government or, or other uh, grant making agencies. And thirdly, project belonging. Um, for those schools or educators or parents who are interested in a program like that, their kids can access um, the training uh, even online over the summer through learning management system at Columbia University. Um, all of our team members are trained uh, in terms of well-being and safety of, um, of kids, not only at the state level, but at Columbia University level. Um, and uh, we have all of the requisite approvals to not only offer training, but students actually earn um, certifications of participation uh, by Columbia University. So it can be something that's helpful to them within their own communities. So if they just find me online, they can reach out um, to us through through our websites and uh, my team and I will be able to direct them to different resources they might be interested in. Fantastic. And is there a, a website for your, do you have an author website or a place we can go to learn more about Three Summers and the cat I didn't name? Yes, uh, people can go to uh, my personal website, um, which is my last name. It's a long last name. So it's S-A-B-I-C-E-L-R-A-Y-E-S-S dot -S org. Um, or they can simply uh, Google the cat I never named or, or three summers and uh, uh, my website should um, should show up and they can explore it not only in terms of three summers and the cat I never named, but also in terms of the projects that I had um, that I had mentioned. They all featured on, the, on my personal website as well. Well, this has been uh, a really eye opening and powerful conversation. And I'm, I'm so happy that you're able to to be with us today to not only talk about Three Summers, but all the other great work uh, that you're doing and hopefully uh, that we will join you in doing in the future. Uh, we've been celebrating the Three Summers, a new middle grade novel from our guest, Dr. Amra Shabic El Reyes. Dr. Amra, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so very much for having me. Hey there, families. Are you looking for an exciting way to bond and learn together? Look no further than our STEM is Family Fun video series. 
Join us as we explore the fascinating world of STEM through hands-on activities right in your own home. Our series features lessons from experts at renowned institutions like the San Diego Children's Discovery Museum, the National Children's Museum in Washington, D.C., and Children's Museum Houston. From making homemade rainbow bridges to creating an oboe out of a straw, there's something for everyone in the family to enjoy. So grab your lab coats and get ready for an adventure. Go to readingwithyourkids.com and click on the STEM is Family Fun link at the top of the page and let the learning and laughter begin. STEM is Family Fun, where learning and bonding go hand in hand. One of the things that's just discouraging for me as a Catholic, as someone who went to a Jesuit school. Where'd you go? Boston College High School. Oh, my gosh. That's both in there. I mean, you're going to be there in April. That's right, yeah. <laughs> um, but those lines seem to me, a, a lot of folks who call themselves Christians and Catholics are the ones with the, um, the brightest markers drawing those lines between people. Well, I, I, I think that requires a new way of uh, seeing. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between orthopraxis and orthodoxy. You know, mm -hmm. People who think it has to look this way, it has to be this way. Ortho, orthodoxy people uh, draw lines. But orthopraxis people try to erase them. Mm -hmm. And so... The invitation of the orthopraxis person is to is to live as though the truth were true and to be anchored in the gospel and to somehow um, move the dial to to another place, you mm -hmm. know, to somehow um, um, I don't know put first things recognizably first, and, and that's that's the hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things I, I love in, in both of the books is the idea of just recognizing and seeing the God that's living inside all of us. Yeah, it, it wants to uh, propose something more spacious and expansive, an understanding. So we settle for a tiny and a puny and a vindictive and a punitive God, and basically the God created in our own image. Mm -hmm. And... And so the invitation is to move beyond that to something uh, more broad and mm -hmm. uh, expansive, as I said, and, yeah. and, and something that is more inclusive. So I think there's nothing more consequential in the world than how, how we see God, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, you're kind of doomed to... Uh, to imitate the kind of God you believe in, mm -hmm. and if and if your God is puny and tiny, then that's what's going to happen, and that's 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 how you will see. But you know, here we deal with gang members, and so the notion here is about trying to get underneath um, criminality, if mm -hmm. you will, and and how are we to see it, and how are we to understand it, and. Uh, so that we can get underneath it and have a different diagnosis than the one that we, you know, always embrace. Mm -hmm. One of the things I had uh, the pleasure of taking, uh, just finishing a tour here of, of Homeboy Industries, and one of the things that struck me is the joy that I experienced with everybody that we met. There's just this... There's constant hugging and smiling and, <laughs> you know, things that people won't necessarily think about when they're thinking, uh, well, my wife who's back at the hotel, when she hears homeboy, it's like, no, 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 that's not for me. I'm, mm -mm, I, I'm staying here. I'm staying here. In the Marriott. <laughs> How did you, I know it's love, it's acceptance, but. How are you, were you able to succeed in, in bringing that joy here where a lot of other programs aren't able to be successful? I, you know, I don't know if it's a thing I do. You know, I think this is a sacred place. I think it's created uh, 
a community of tenderness that's quite compelling and people feel it the second they walk in. And uh, and it's a foreign thing. You know, John Bonnier says that um, uh, tenderness is the highest form of spiritual maturity. So this place kind of invites the world to, to become that. So mm -hmm. it wants to be what it thinks the world is invited to become. And uh, so, so you can feel it here. Mm -hmm. it, otherwise, nothing works. You can't deliver services unless it's a place of tenderness and trust and where people feel safe. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's kind of what this place offers. And once, once they can enter and inhabit that, that sacred place of where people feel safe and valued and, and there's trust, then they can, you know, inhabit the truth of who they are, that they're exactly what God had in mind, mm -hmm. what God made them. So then they become that self, and then they can leave here after 18 months resilient people, and they can embrace the adventure, which is the world out there. Yeah. And then now they know how to navigate all the crises of intimacy and mm -hmm. generativity and all the things that are going to get thrown at them, and they won't get toppled by it this time. Yeah. If a parent is out there thinking, gee, I, I don't know if this is something that I want to co-read with my kids or listen to in the car, the audio version of either of your books, what would you say to, to maybe encourage them and kind of uh, give them a, a second way of looking at that? The teenagers will like it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of raw and real and, uh, you know, and it's funny mm -hmm. and heartbreaking and and it's uh, I wouldn't say I wrote it for them but it's certainly accessible to them mm -hmm. absolutely well, one of the things that, that um, I, I that struck me again yesterday as I was uh, listening on the plane coming back was um, I, I think I get the quote right um, uh, Every once in a while, a crazy old lady might drop a few turds in your basket, but that doesn't mean you have to <laughs> eat it. <laughs> Let me just say that that quote <laughs> deserves a context. Thank you very much. Well, would you like to provide the context? <laughs> <laughs> no. It's, it's a story about um, oh, well, a brother Jesuit of mine, Mark Torres, who I just saw walk by, who works here, and he... Um, he was a kid, and he said he was always kind of the Charlie Brown of kids in costumes. He was the last kid to get to the door mm -hmm. for the candy, and he did it, this one thing. And this woman said, oh, my God, I've run out of candy. And then she says, oh, no, wait a minute. Teet these tutus, she says. And he thinks to himself, teet these tutus. And all of a sudden she comes back, and she drops some, something in his bag. And... And then a dog barks, and she goes, Titi, shush. <laughs> and uh, he gets back at the end of the day, and this woman has deposited in his bag two very firm dog turds. And there was some moral of that story somewhere in there, which you just quoted. <laughs> but it's more about being curious about the things that happen to us rather than horrified, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I think is a good idea. Absolutely. Well, I certainly think that uh, Tattoos on the Heart and Barking to the Choir would be great additions to any family library. And I especially um, would recommend the audio version uh, because you're narrating it and uh, you can feel the emotion. Um, you, it sounds like you're reliving the stories as, you, as you're telling them. Um, well, the stories, you know, they were, they're all part of talks I've given mm -hmm. before they ever got to the page. So I kind of know, know the stories uh, pretty inside and out. Mm -hmm. Very few are ones that I've never told. And um, so I know every uh, crevice and corner. And uh, so I'm not really reading the stories when I do the audio versions because I, I know I've, I've, I've spoken these stories and I... 
Before we invite our guest into the studio, I would love to invite you to visit a very special website. It's clownswithoutborders.org. Clownswithoutborders.org. This is a group that I absolutely adore. I am part of Clowns Without Borders, and I had the honor of being part of the 2023 tour of El Salvador. I had so much fun joining with artists from all over the world to bring a smile to people who really needed it and, and, and really appreciated it, too. And we would love for you to join us as a monthly join maker. Uh, the join makers, they're a family of people just like you who love to laugh and make other people feel good. So please take a moment and visit clownswithoutborders.org and consider joining me as a join maker. We are going to take a flight together right now. Our guest here at the Westbrook Outlet Mall, the Connecticut Book Festival, is Pina Bird. Hey, Pina, how are you? Hi, how are you? I am delighted. I've met so many wonderful authors here today. That's fantastic. Yeah. Tell me, tell me. <laughs> Who did you meet? We, we met Diane and Greg and Bronwyn and learning about their stories, learning about the inspiration. And I can't wait to hear about your story. Uh, so I, uh, I've always wanted to write when I was a little girl. I just wrote stories. I used to have my cousins sleep over and we used to just write all these great stories. And, you know, I kept them for years and years. Um, and then, you know, they got tucked away and... Um, and then uh, COVID came, and uh, you know my creativity, my talent, and it wasn't just that. It was a point in my my career that I, it was something that you know, what is it that you really want to do? And it, it was always in my heart to to write. Um, so um, it just gave me a reason to write. Was uh, during COVID, and my first uh, published book, Fred the Super Friend, came out um, in 2020. Isn't it? I, I think COVID is going to go down as the pandemic that launched a million books and two million podcasts. Actually, <laughs> this, I know that number is for sure. Yeah. It, it's you know, I don't know. It, so many authors in, in our generation they tell me, "Oh, I, I always wanted to write a book, but I never got a chance until now." Um, I, I don't know if that's something to be sad about or something it's like well it kind of had to happen because we had to live before we had something to write about I, I, I would believe that's true yes yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so what kind of things in your life um, inspired your, your first book so uh, you know uh, my first career uh, as a real estate agent I've been doing it for 30 years um, it was that, you know, the stories. I have lots of stories to share. Uh, so Fred the Super is actually, he's a superintendent in a high-rise building. And uh, I just may, I, I, you know, I see things in, in my walk of life. And uh, Fred the Super is a character. Um, and certain uh, personalities of people that came together. Uh, and you want a Fred in your life. You want Fred. He's 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 helpful. He's always there whenever you need him. Uh, and in this particular story, Fred the Super, uh, one snowy night, uh, all the animals that live in the apartment building um, had one problem or another. It was a it was a, a blizzard that was coming, and he couldn't fix their plumbing problems. So, uh, but they had nowhere to go. So he said, "Well, I guess you can stay at my place." And so they did. And he lived in the building, obviously, because he's a superintendent. He lived in the building. Uh, and one, one thing uh, led to another. Um, but he realized that, you know, as much as he loved the sound of the big city, which that's what it starts with, um, he realized that he loved the sounds of the laughter and the, and the familiar music that was playing. And uh, it was just everybody coming together as a community. Uh, and it's about kindness. It's about helping your neighbor. It's about generosity. Uh, and that's who Fred is. And I went on with another series of Fred the Super Saves the Mangroves. Uh, and that goes into um, uh, teaching children about the environment and how important it is not to litter and how it affects the sea animals. So uh, I have four books. Uh -huh. My third one is Chicken Livers and Artichokes, which is a book about um, cultural differences and acceptance, especially with what's going on in our society. Uh, and I do it through food. 
So, um, and teaching children that to other cultures and getting familiar with other cultures, but through food and how we are all really one as a family. And then my fourth one is a Christmas story, which is a beautiful story about a little palm tree who gets caught up in a New England delivery, like anywhere up here in Westbrook or whatever, and on a nursery. Uh, all the Christmas trees tell her, no way, you don't belong here, and a uh, series of events happen. She perseveres through all these challenges, uh, and she ends up being the last one on the lot on Christmas Eve. Santa Claus heard about it. He came down, and he had a long talk with her, and explained to her that, you know, because of her goodness and her perseverance, that he wanted to adorn her branches. She ends up being the village Christmas tree. Wonderful. So all my stories all have happy endings with a theme and a meaning. There's so much there. You know, your Christmas story reminds me of a time uh, my beautiful wife and I, we wanted to, we used to get the big giant tree that filled up the whole room, but the kids are, are grown-ups now, and so we want something a little bit smaller. And I wanted something that we could plant and, you know, so it could live on. And so we got this beautiful, beautiful tree, and we got it home, and it was great for, for Christmas. But then when we went to plant it, we read the tag a little bit closer. We found out that it was a native to Florida. <laughs> And then it wasn't going to do very good in Boston Aww. at any time of the year. So uh, it found a lovely home down south. Okay. I'm very happy about that. The Frigid Super Series, um, it reminds me of that, uh, like a lot of our TV and, and uh, TV shows and books are set in places where different people come in, like a hospital or the, the, you know, the police dramas or lawyer things. If they're de dealing with people from all walks of life. And that's what Fred is. It's kind of like an introduction to that type of storytelling. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, because obviously there's lots, people, lots of people in the apartment. And right. One's a doctor and one's right. a teacher. And, you know, <laughs> yes. also, lots a, lot of, of, a lot of different characters, yeah, 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 yeah. within the building, yeah. There's Melton the Mouse and uh, uh, Sutton the Squirrel, which is really, uh, he's an orange squirrel. And there's Sutton, Massachusetts, where I got his name. Okay. And there's orange squirrels. And he became, he's an orange squirrel. So he's in the, he's in the book. Very, very small, small uh, supporting actor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he's in the story. <laughs> now, any chance that you're going to have a real estate agent in one of your stories? I don't know. I never thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. But that's an, that's something to think about for sure. Where other than um, your, your, your stories, it, it's, it's, I have to learn how to speak English again. <laughs> it's okay. Your, um, do you find inspiration? We, we have Joan, Jane Yolen. It's mission is to one of the other authors um, who's written four, over 400 children's books, traditionally wow. published books. And uh, wonderful, wonderful woman, wonderful writer. She said that she could find stories anywhere. That that dozens and dozens of stories exist in every moment of your life. We're here at the at the Westbrook Outlet Mall. There's uh, Old Navy here, and all the authors and lovely green space over here. Just as a challenge, can you find a story here as you're looking around? I, I, I can definitely, you know, tell you a story about, I can see the chair. I see a chair out there, and the chair just seems, he seems really lonely, and maybe he would want that, maybe a person to sit on the chair. Yeah. And, you know, and, the, and that's, how, that's how stories are, and she's absolutely right. You know, you look at something, something really inspires you. But, yes, you can make a story out of anything. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's what excites you the most. So um, I am have, I'm coming out with two more stories at the end of this year. Um, one is another Fred story, uh, and that's uh, a story about how he found Frida because Frida is his pet parrot, and it's about how he found her. So it's about adopting Frida. So that's a story. And then I have a, a new, new character in a new book, which is going to be Dexter the Dinosaur. Oh, so he's cool. going to uh, – it's an interesting story – um, about his anxieties that he has. So, um, yeah, so, you know, I, I have fun with, with things. People give me suggestions, and I think about them, and whatever excites me, I start writing. Awesome. Tell me, what advice do you have for somebody 
you shared with us that you know you had this career and this came to a time in your life when you finally got around to writing the book, something you had always wanted to do. What about somebody who's out there who's maybe just four or five years into their career but still wants to be a writer? What advice would you have for that person? Do it. Just, you know, uh, and if you don't know how to do it, reach out to, say, uh, maybe another author. Um, uh, you can go online. There's websites. There's Facebook pages, and you can just find other authors and just start asking them questions on how to how to get started. Um, I, I have a, a laundry list of people, uh, and I also you know took courses and classes. So I have a, I'm I'm part of a bigger author group, and I think if you can try to get into those groups, you can learn a lot by getting started. That's a really good point. I think a lot of people, they say, oh, I'd like to write a book, but I don't know how. I don't have that talent. You have to be born with that talent. It really is. It's, it's a craft. It's a skill. And um, there are a lot of people out there that are willing to help you out. Great advice. Great advice. We should tell everybody where they can go to find out more about you and your great books. So you can go to peanutbirdbooks.com. That's P-I-N-A. Bird, B-I-R-D, books, B-O-O-K-S dot com, Peanut Bird Books, and uh, that's my website, and you can pick up a book, and you can sign it and ship it to wherever you like. Thank you for being on Reading With Your Kids. Thank you so much for having me. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Reading With Your Kids, and will join us for the next exciting episode of the show. Until then, we'd love for you to connect with us on social media, facebook.com slash reading with your kids, at reading with your kids on Instagram and TikTok, and at Jedly Magic on Twitter. You have an open invitation to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. There's so much that you can find there. Check it out today, please. Want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Chris, we're going to start by thanking our guests, Dr. Amra Chabitz El Reyes, Father Gray Boyle, and Peanut Bird. I want to thank my incredible team, Fatima Khan, Chris Doherty, Rory Grady, Judy Hu. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place. And you do that every time you read with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next episode of... Reading with your kids.